latest from the ZD Network Newsroom. Hello, I'm Victoria Racano for ZDNN. One day after the White House Cybersecurity Summit following the denial of service attacks, a federal website is hacked. At least four Department of Transportation pages were defaced by someone going by the name of Artec. The message included an offer to secure the site. And the man who once said he invented the Internet says access to computers and the net is nothing less than a civil right of all Americans. Vice President Al Gore this week proposed a partnership between the government and private industry to give every American easy and affordable access to high-speed net connections. However, he did not provide any specifics on the program or how to pay for it. For more news, check out our website. That's at ZDNN.com. And stay tuned for more updates. Screensavers, I'm Leo Laporte. And I'm Martin Sargent. Thanks for joining us. Coming up in today's show... Kate has a day off. Kate. That's why he's so tall. I am not Kate. <laughs> Kate okay. is sick. Martin. You know what Leo's going to do, though? Leo's going to chat with a Windows power user who's oh, here yeah. with a few tips to improve your computing experience. It's going to be amazing. One of my favorite Windows gurus is going to take a look at Windows 2000. Also, this week's Geek Library looks forward to the design of things to come. It is my... One of my all-time favorite books. You're going to love this book. It's coming up in a little bit. Plus, I'm going to have a look at a couple of digital drawing tablets that will have you painting with your computer in a GIF. Yes. Amazing stuff. Plus, I'm going to give away the keys to my car a little bit later on. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> but first, <laughs> I don't know. It was in my pocket. What can I say? Before we talk about today's topic in the chat room, you're not getting those keys back. Let's I know. take a you, look at the final results. <laughs> I know, I've seen your car. I mean, you probably do want to get rid of it. Let's take a look at yesterday's poll results. Yes, we asked you, and how question, often do you surf while watching TV? Wow. 43% say always. That surprises me. 29% say sometimes. 13 never. 15% only when ZDTV is on. All right, there we go. I am amazed. Now, of course, this is a, our audience, so yeah, I, it's right. not surprising. That it's, but that 43%. That is, we've always thought that probably a lot of you were, but I never thought... I always sort of had a suspicion, but I'm still in the mode where computer in one room, TV in the other. Yeah, I have, you, know? you, you and me, me and Kate, too. We don't have the yeah. TV and the computer together. Obviously, a lot of you do. And we're glad, because it's great, because you can go to our website and get lots of more information. Our chat topic of the day, you ready for this one? Let's do it. You tell me the answer on this one, Martin. <laughs> are, you, are you drowning in email? I am. I'm not. You're not? No. You don't get I'll a lot tell of mail? you why. I used to. When I worked at PC Computing, I got so much mail. All the marketeers, the PR people, sure. send me mail all the time. Sure. When I switched jobs, I didn't tell anyone where I was going. <laughs> they For that they're... reason. I was so sick of these people pitching their dumb products to me, you know. Martin at ZDTV.com. <laughs> let, let the flood See, begin. See, you don't even know what my email That's address not it? is. No. Oh, dang. <laughs> well, everybody knows how to find me, and I am drowning. We get over uh, just the, the two shows I do, we get over 1,000 See, emails a day. The, the shows get that much email. And sometimes well, when, you know, they get too much email and no one answers the question, then they write to me. And well, and that's exactly what question. I love it when people do that, so. You do? Yeah. Oh, man. I, that's Oof. exactly what happens is they send email to us. Uh -huh. We can't, obviously, answer all of those emails individually. We just can't. Uh, and then they say they find all my other addresses, and I get mail to all my addresses. And I am totally drowning in right. email. But in fact, this study was interesting because it said uh, they did a sample of sending to corporations, and what was it, 80% were not responded to at all. Thing. Simple questions like, what's your address? What's your mailing address? Who's your CEO? The corporations were just ignoring them. And I confess, I probably ignore about 80% of my email, too. I'm drowning in email. Are you? Here's your chance. What do you think? Why don't you go take our web poll at the screensavers.com, and while you're there, be sure to click on our talkback feature to express your opinion to us and the rest of the screensavers community. You can also call us. You don't have to email us. 888-989-7879 or chat with us. Chat.ZDNet.com. The screensavers room is the place to be. All right. Or, of course, if you're on a netcam and you want to ask us a question on the air, why don't you go talk to our netcam hosts in the netcam Cineplex 
And remember, if you appear on the are. show, <laughs> it's Look. Roger and Shannon. Email, email no is life, life baby. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess email them, don't call them. Yeah. And if you do that, of course, if you talk to those people in there and get on the show, you're going to get one of those cool screensavers magnets. As seen on our refrigerator, who's that in the magnet today? It's a little furry baby. Oh, that's a cute, that's a, <laughs> our, our guest today, one-year-old Emily. Her mom and dad, Trish and Brian from Oklahoma City, sent us Emily's picture. It's a little furry baby. <laughs> yeah. By the way, you two can get your picture on our fridge. Send it to the screensavers at ZDTV.com. Put fridge picture in the subject line. <laughs> and uh, we will uh, we'll put the, uh, the children or whatever, the dog, the cat, the monkey on the refrigerator. Kevin joins us on the ZDTV 3Com Netcam Network from Exeter, PA. Hello, Kev. Hey, Leo. Hey, Martin. How's hey, it going, Martin. Kevin? You're my favorite guest co-host. All right. Let's Seriously. hear it for him, Martin. Good. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. That's, That's you. nice. Me too. I feel that way too. <laughs> what can we do for you? Um, I would like to know the difference between a uh, wave and a voc file. That's a great question. Voc file was the or voc file or I don't know voc file was the standard when sound blasters first came out in the good the bad old days of I almost said the good old days of DOS. Uh, and, and it was before Waves. Waves uh, came out when Windows came out. Microsoft made that kind of the default standard for, uh, for digital audio. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't much technical difference between a VOC and a Wave. They both use PCM recording techniques. You can easily map a VOC to a Wave. You just basically change the header. If you have old VOC files, there are plenty of converters out there that will read them. You know, things like CoolEdit, uh, SoundForge. There's even like standalone converters you can get from HotFiles.com that will convert a VOC to a Wave. But VOC is just basically the old Sound Blaster format, now outmoded because Windows is here and Wave is the standard. You know, in the old days of sound, remember, you know, you, you guys are too young, but I remember the old days, the first PCs, the only sound they had was a little speaker that could go beep and boop. There was no digital sound, and it was a big deal when, when Creative Labs came out with a Sound Blaster, suddenly added the capability to play back sound. Do you remember, you are probably about eight years old, Disney came out with a little box that hooked up to your parallel port, the Disney sound port. I think I was two. <laughs> you might have been. And that was like a big deal. Kids games could suddenly talk and stuff. This was all back in the DOS right. day. And of course there was no standard. There were all different file formats. But still, what a revolution. I mean, think about oh, the man. PC before the use of sound. I mean, totally different thing altogether. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's hard for me to realize. I mean, this wasn't that long. We're talking less, less really, than 20 years ago. Very and we've had this ago. huge change. Anyway, that's what it is. Do you have some, Kevin? Is that why you want to know? Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's like any pretty much like technical difference to it besides as far as I know they're both using pulse code modulation which is a standard way of recording digital data it's a, and it I do know it's a very easy you know you don't have to worry about the format it's a very easy conversion right. many programs like cool edit will read in voc files and save them out do you know who came out with wave Microsoft did it was a Microsoft invention uh -huh. uh, with uh, I don't think it was Windows 3.1 I think you know I have to ask Brian Livingston he would know our Windows guru is here I think it I'm well it might have been 3.1 it was certainly by Windows 95 okay all right, thanks. Hey, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Take care. Thanks, Kevin. All right, after the break, we're going to learn why things game. are made the way they are. I promise we'll be more specific when the screen save is continued. I've been waiting to find that out. <laughs> wow. Why are things the way they are? The screen savers is sponsored by Gateway. Gateway speaks to 50,000 people a day. Call, click, or go in and connect with them. Just when you think you have the latest computer, you don't. But you can get one that's never outdated. Come to Gateway Country, the only place to get a fresh PC you can trade in toward the purchase of a new one after two years. Featuring the AMD Athlon processor at 600 megahertz for $37 a month. Do you have to hit some golf balls? Sure. You're a young guy, right? How old are you? I'm 36. Now, are you uh, at all concerned about your financial future, or are you so young it doesn't occur to you to worry about it at this point? I don't want to make you worry. Well, but... I am concerned. You're out there in the fairway, and you've had a pretty good wood shot, but you need to uh, select your next tool. The same thing with investing. You've got to have the right tools. Now, E-Trade, for example, gives you an incredibly valuable tool. You can sit down at your computer and get information about how to invest in mutual funds anytime, night or day. Our exclusive Power Search tool screens over 5,000 mutual funds. Choose your criteria, and it instantly provides a customized list of funds that match your goals. Many with no loads. And best of all, Power Search is free. 
Does it sound good? It sounds great. And if you sign up now, E-Trade will put $75 in your account. Maybe I'll just stick to investing. Be a part of the fastest growing network on TV. The ZDTV 3Com Netcam Network. Order. The online community that puts Woo. you on ZDTV. You're watching Silicon Sting. Asking computer questions. I've got a little problem with my Clio. Hey. Showing yeah. your digital shorts and chatting with our hosts. Hi. Aloha, gentlemen. Aloha, children. Go to ZDTV.com and send us your email today. Amaze yourself. ZDTV. Amaze yourself. Hi, Leo and Kate. This is Sam, the retired fireman from Sun City, Summerlin, Las Vegas, Nevada. This is my first email test, and I've been watching you on ZDTV for quite some time. So I'll give it a try. And hi to you. Bye-bye. Got a computer problem? Call for Help has your answers and tips with articles, searchable archives, and message boards. Go to ZDTV.com, click on Call for Help. Once again for the uh, Screensavers Geek Library. Is this your first time in the Geek Library? No, come on. You've been here, I've been here before? Oh, I've right. got a library card to the Geek Library. <laughs> Actually, you checked out this book and I think you liked it, didn't you? Oh, it's a fantastic book. Yeah, this is where we recommend for your geek pleasure one of our all-time favorite books or a movie or software type. We, we even have done web bookmarks, but this time we're going to do a book. A book I've been trying to get for a long time. I was up in my attic looking for it. Finally, oddly enough, I found it in one of the bookshelves here at ZDTV. This should be in everybody's bookshelf if you're in involved in design, uh, whether that's hardware, software, or appliances. It's Donald A. Norman's The Design of Everyday Things. You've got to love this on the front cover. Yeah, look at the design of that's that. Called... Really, what this is about is the design of really bad things. <laughs> this is a badly things designed coffee pot. Things that went wrong in the designing table. Actually, it's a work of art called the Masochist Coffee Pot. But there are things in the real world as poorly designed as this. If you're one of those people who's sitting looking at a VCR blinking 12... Uh, I have no idea how to set the VCR. But a lot I of people it. blame themselves. They go, oh, I should know that. It's just, you know, I, I'm not smart enough. You know the best way to fix that? You take a black piece of tape and you <laughs> stick it <laughs> over there. You never have to worry about it again. Well, Don's point in this is it's not your fault. That's right. It is the fault of the designer. These things, if they're properly designed, should be intuitive. You should be able to walk up to it, given your cultural background, expectations, and knowledge, and immediately grok it. You should go, oh, for instance. Right, we should not have to get used to the machines. The machine should be designed already used to precisely. us. Precisely. When you walk up to a door, most of the time it's pretty <laughs> obvious what to do. Although he tells a great anecdote in here about a friend who was in a Swiss post office, and like many buildings, office buildings, it had two layers of doors to keep the heat in and the cold air out. He went through the first door, somehow turned around and got disoriented and was pushing on the wrong side of the door. Happens all the Suddenly, time. Suddenly, he just, he freaked out. He said, I'm locked in. Couldn't, he was stuck in there pushing on the wrong side of the door because there was no sign that said push, no plate. And that's this why guy has put, a PhD. PhD. You normally, you put a plate on a door, right, where you push. No, it was nice, clean glass, right? Bad design. He was stuck there until some tourists came through, walked right, and he just followed them out. <laughs> well, think about a regular keyboard, a QWERTY keyboard. There is absolutely no rhyme or reason to the way that those keys are on it's there. It's the in worst. Fact, this guy, Scholes, the guy who designed this thing back in the 1870s, the only reason he designed it like this is he put often used keys, like the I and the E, they often go together, had to put them on opposite sides of the keyboard because if they were together, it wouldn't function properly. The machine would jam. Right, and ever since then, we've been using this crazy <laughs> scheme. Even though there's nothing to jam left. If you yeah. blame yourself, if sometimes you feel like the world is conspiring against you, if you are a software designer, a web designer, if you're a hardware designer, this is a must-read book. It's really fun to read. I highly recommend it. I was totally inspired and turned on by it. It kind of has formed my life philosophy in many ways. I <laughs> really encourage you. By the way, to read it, Don Norman, former Apple fellow, Apple is right. to hire him. He's now in a consulting firm with our other favorite designer, Jacob Nielsen, and they go around saying, bad design. Bad I think design. he also works for you next. 
actually. Yeah, really great stuff. Yes, he had a startup that he did. To fill out your Geek Library, check out our website for a complete listing of all of Kate and Leo and Martin's Geek Library recommendations. It's at thescreensavers.com. All right, we received an email from James, and James says, I'm a student, I'm thinking about a career in graphic design, but to paint on a PC, I need something more precise than amounts. Could you recommend a drawing tablet that's productive but also Ooh. cheap enough for a student like me to buy? Mm. We put Martin to work, and he's come up with some great solutions. I got here. a great one for you. It's called the Wacom Graphire. It only costs about $100, and I have talked to a slew of graphic designers, and this is the one that they all use. In fact, the people here at ZDTV who do our graphic design swear by the Graphire. Now, let me show you this. Um, this is um, hooked up to the serial port. Uh, this is actually USB. USB. It also comes in the serial port okay. version. And what is this? It comes with a mouse, too. That's a mouse. It's an RF mouse. There's no ball on the bottom. And actually how it works is with uh, sensitivity. It's a pressure mouse. There's a grid of wires underneath there. And that combined with the RF, that's how you move it around. So I don't, when I use the pad and I hook the pad up, I don't give up my mouse. I can Not still at all. Use In fact, you can still use your regular PS2 mouse. You can use this one at the same oh, time, though. And actually, what you would want to do is have this absolutely replace your mouse pad and mouse, I w would say. Wacom has made tablets for years. I've always loved them. But they've really improved the technology. Show us a little bit about how this, uh, how this works. All this right. Is, it's, this comes with a great program called Painter Classic. That's right. Door. And listen, this is just like painting a picture. I mean, you can't actually compare this to painting, but it feels a whole lot like painting. I mean, you don't get the, the friction with the brush strokes and everything. I'll choose the pencil to start. And, uh, you know, I'll just sketch a little face here or something like now, that. Now, this tablet is using pressure, right? It's using pressure. This tablet has 512 distinct layers of pressure. So you can tell this right away when I switch to, say, the paintbrush. Mm -hmm. And now I'll just do a wispy light line. You see how it comes through? Right. But when I press harder, well, I get this that. big fat line. You're look at the brush You're smushing the brush. There. Yeah, I don't know Amazing. if you can see the detail, but it's really remarkable. It really it feels and looks right. Yeah, and uh, let me show you That's one more That's the software, cool thing. though, by the way, not yeah, the this tablet. Yeah, this is the software. It's wonderful stuff. I could paint in the style of all these different artists, Van Gogh, Surratt, John Singer Sargent, <laughs> my that. boy, John Singer Sargent, uh, all this stuff. I'll do Surratt, you know, Surratt with his pointillism. So look at that. Oh, it's pointillism. There you go, right like that. Now, if you turn the pen upside down, is this an eraser? Yeah, but um, doesn't work. I, it does work. What I have to do, though, is actually select and there's ways that I could program it. I'm sure that I wouldn't have to select if okay. there is an eraser function that I would select. Now, one thing uh, I noticed in my day when we had pads, tablets, we this had to have a wire on it. Right. This doesn't have any sort of wire. There's not even a battery in here. Wait, no, it's, really? getting, it's feeding its energy off of the RF. And if I think of like when you're tuning a piano, when you bring the tuning fork near the piano strings, yeah. it vibrates. It goes energy going back and forth. That's what's happening that's here. What They're talking energy. once every 20 nanoseconds. See, now that's great because I used to run through the batteries on these like crazy. Right. And they're these little tiny watch batteries. They're a real pain to replace. These never run out. And this little switch here, you can program stuff in there, say like a switch brush size or something okay. like that. I didn't do that because I found when I was doing it, I would hit it and invertly and switch the brush size. How much? $99. Right. Now, if you wanted to, it, this is a small surface. And I know a lot of artists like a larger surface. If you, if you want to spend more, you can get a larger right. surface. This is the uh, Wacom Intuits line. This is the 9 by 12 version. $450, a lot more. It has a lot more sensitivity, 1024 levels, in fact. It's got an airbrush functionality, all sorts of really cool and stuff. And these function keys at the top right, here. Very simple, just to click on there. This is specifically used mostly by like CAD experts and architects who really need a big workspace to get their work done. Right. Unlike artists who, you know, I thought I would want a bigger one, but when I started using that. This that small 4x5 area is all you need. Yeah. And this is awkward to store and to keep right. around. Well, I like it because it sits on your lap oh, you're, you're using it. Yeah. Right. Some, okay. But, yeah, it is kind so of So which would you prefer of the two if, if price weren't a, uh, an issue? Uh, if price weren't an issue, I would take the more expensive like the one, one, of course. But for anyone who's thinking about going into graphic design or a traditional artist who's thinking about doing it, wants to make that move, I definitely recommend the Wacom Graphfire, $99 to $100, somewhere around there. USB. Great software, USB or parallel. I okay. use both, and they both work pretty well. Okay. There are some issues with the USB. We had a little bit of trouble installing it before the show, but, you know, that's just USB. That's, that's not the tablet. Okay. Yeah, my mom is an artist, and um, she's used these in the past on her mm -hmm. Mac, and I've got to get her this. This yeah. is obvious. And also, see how you just flip that up? That's so you can trace over Oh, stuff. so you put something underneath yeah. there. Oh, yeah. I get it. And uh, that's really cool. Very nice. And it comes with that great Painter Classic, which is, I Fantastic think, one of the best software programs. Program. From Fractal Design. I actually met a Creations now on them, I think. Yep. All right, cool. Thank you, Martin. Some great stuff. Coming up next, Martin's heading into the chat room if you want to ask him about his artistic style. He's actually pretty good, you know, he does some good stuff. But coming up, we're going to reveal hidden features of Windows 2000 with Brian Livingston. He's the co author of Windows 2000 Secrets, and he's going to share with us everything that Microsoft didn't when the screensavers continues. It's true. No. So you
you've got the best e-commerce website on the net, right? Prove it. Enter the UPS Merchant of the Week contest and you can win free promotion on ZDTV. Who has the coolest design? The best customer service? Register your site and let our viewers judge. Your .com could be featured on ZDTV for a whole week. The Merchant of the Week contest is on now. Register at ZDTV.com. Click on the Merchant of the Week. Just imagine being linked to a source of information, to a global internet adventure. Just imagine clarity in a world of chaos. Now, there's a new television network, ZDTV, your home for entertainment, explaining the power of computers and the internet, creating a world of possibilities. ZDTV, amaze yourself. The Screensavers.com, it's the place for more information about what's on this show. Have you uh, subscribed to the Screensavers show notes yet? You get all the details of everything we talk about on the program, special links from my fingers to your inbox. Subscribe now at thescreensavers.com. It's here! Da -da 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 -da. Windows 2000, it comes out tomorrow. Bill Gates is in San Francisco right now for a big party. They've been partying for two days, and tomorrow's the big rollout. And we're going to show you how to increase your productivity in Windows 2000 with some insider power, some user tips from the guy, the man, Brian Livingston, the author of Windows 2000 Secrets. Welcome to the Screen Savers, nice Brian. To be here. You've been writing these secrets books since 95, at least, yeah? Oh, way back. We started with Windows 3.0 Secrets. Really? And Windows 3.1 Secrets, Windows 95 Secrets. Windows 2000 really gives you a lot more than you get with Windows 98, so those people who can afford it We'll be using Windows 2000 right away, I think. I, you know, I have been very happy with Windows 2000. I have, a, of course, a multiprocessor machine, so I was using NT, too, before then. Sure. But 2000 is easier to use. It supports a lot more of my hardware. Um, do you like it? You've been obviously using it for a while to write the book. Yeah, we've used it in beta for over a year uh -huh. to write Windows 2000 Secrets. Uh, it is more stable. It crashes less. It, it does support crashes. more kinds of things. It doesn't not crash, right? Well, we can make it crash. That yeah. is not a problem. <laughs> but you will probably find that it crashes less Much often. Less. People who have websites, people who have business networks, they will be using it, and it'll stay going a lot more days than Windows NT would. Microsoft is really discouraging end users, consumers, from buying this. I think because it doesn't crash, a lot of consumers are looking at it. Should they be, or should they be shying away? Well, it's actually a conspiracy that Microsoft is telling people, don't use Windows 2000 if you just have a home computer. Right. And then all those people out there will say, oh, if they don't want me to use it, then maybe I should get it. <laughs> That's good marketing. Very they good marketing. Be, they might be right. Mar Microsoft has been a great marketing company. Actually, if you have Windows 98 and you like it, then you don't need to get Windows 2000. Don't buy it just because it's the latest thing. Right. But if you have Windows NT or you have a server or a network in your business, then you should go to Windows 2000 as soon as you can because really? Windows 2000 does improve Windows NT, which is Microsoft's old server software. Now, you've been writing these secrets books, as you said, for a while. How do you find these things? I mean, what do you do? You well, on the beta testers who are in Microsoft's program love to talk. And so hackers uh -huh. love to hack and beta testers love to talk. So we ask them, what does this do and how does this do this? Right. We have beta testers who will spend a week just finding secrets in right. one little part of Windows 2000. Is it They'll not, tell us and we print it. Is it not documented? Is Microsoft not documented? Or is it just hard to find the document? It is somewhere, and you might find it hard to find. And so we've spent about 12 months of right. our lives, and I have two other people who helped to co-author this book, right. finding these tricks, and then we write them down so you don't have to spend months with a search engine looking for them yourself. Show us some stuff. This is Windows 2000. Uh, this is the, uh, I think, the advanced server version. It's running a brand new, just came out. This is the one, the release, not a beta. So using Windows 2000 Server, there are many, many features that are like Windows 2000 Professional, the mm -hmm. desktop version. Mm -hmm. And our book covers things that are in both Windows 2000 Professional and Windows right. 2000 Server. One thing we've found is in Windows 2000, you have a start menu, just like in Windows 98. Mm -hmm. But we found that if you install Windows 2000 on top of Windows 98, some of the items on the menu do not show up. So for example, here I started the start menu, and I'm in the programs group. Right. And you do not see an item in this list called administrative tools. The reason for that is that when uh, this Windows 2000 was installed, let's right click the taskbar and click properties. 
Uh, if you go to the advanced tab in the properties of the taskbar, oh, there's more in here than the 98. There's a little box here that says display administrative tools. Uh -huh. There are a lot more features in here, and for some reason, when you install Windows 2000 over Windows 98 and upgrade it, this is turned off by default. Okay. So you can go in there and turn that on. Now, for those users who like using the keyboard, we'll show you an administrative tool that might not be obvious. It might be hard for you to find, but it's really easy to either go in through the menu or else to type in a simple command that I'm going to show you right now. Let's do it. All right. So for those users who have a keyboard, and I strongly recommend a keyboard for Windows A very good thing to have, yeah. <laughs> you can click the Start menu and click Run. Okay. And we're going to look at a program called Computer Management. So you just type in C-O-M-P-M-G-M-T dot MSC. MSC, not now, EXE. It's not an EXE because Microsoft hasn't provided an executable program to run this computer management window. It's MSC, a module. It is a module. It's a Microsoft console. And I the guess. console controls your computer or manages your computer, hence the name computer management dot Microsoft console. So this is something that would be part of a larger pro... Oh, here it is. Look at if that. we click OK, we get the computer management window. Now, Microsoft has several what they call snap-ins and each of these little right. tools is a snap-in. If you administer a network, you can make a group of snap-ins that the users can use, but here's the whole enchilada right here. Now, by the way, this is also in the administrative menu, so if you, if you didn't remember the thing that you could type, you could just go to the menu that you That's added. That's right. That's right. With most Windows 2000 machines, you can click Start, and then right. go to Programs, and then go to Administrative Tools, what can I do with and this? select this. Well, I recommend that even though you can make a little menu of a few of these items, right. that power users familiarize themselves with computer management. For example, There's let's look at the yeah. local users and groups part of computer management. There are so many things here that we will have time to just look at one. Right. And the local users and groups part of computer management is very powerful. When you install Windows 2000, you will get a name like administrator. Right. And you can give yourself a password or not have a password. And the administrator has full rights to install programs, delete files. Really, you can do a lot of damage to Windows 2000. So one of the things that I'd like to recommend is you click the plus sign near the local users and groups icon and then look at the users here. We see that there's an administrator, we see that there's a guest, and there are some other users that are set up. I recommend that even if you're using Windows 2000 on your own desktop machine at home, that you not be the administrator all the time. That's because if you get a computer virus or if you press the delete key at the wrong time, you can accidentally delete something or a virus could mm -hmm. install itself and corrupt your computer. So if you right-click this and say new user, you can create a new username here. So you just might uh, say Brian. So you create a user with lower uh, capabilities so that they, that person, uh, yourself, cannot mess up yourself. It's the same thing you do in uh, Linux, by the way, is you don't, you don't run as root, you run as a user. That's right. So yeah. if you create a user, then what you do is you uh, right-click that user and put them into a group. And let's show you the groups ah. that we have. By putting that new user in the group called, logically enough, users, the user can run software, the user can save files to the disk, but you can't accidentally delete system files that Windows 2000 they depends on. They have lower on. privileges. What you about power users? Privileges. Would you want to be a power user? Power users are a little bit up from the regular user, right. and they can actually uh, install software and change things that are uh, configurable in the system. So I guess it's just how much you trust yourself. <laughs> well, trusting yourself, I used to work in corporations and we had a rule that we would not log on to right. our own computers as administrator unless somebody else was sitting with us. Wow. And this is not because we didn't trust each other, it's because if we hit the, the delete key, we might delete something easy and we want mistake. somebody looking over our shoulder yeah. just to make sure that we've typed the right command. So That's I recommend right. that you be a user all the time under Windows 2000, but if you want to install a program, log off, log on as administrator, install the program, and then log off and log on as your regular user so you're not uh, taking an unnecessary risk. I'm going home and I'm going to create a user account. I've been administrator all weekend. I don't know what damage I might have done. Great tip, and it's just one of probably a thousand in Windows 2000 Secrets, part of the best-selling series, 3.3 million secrets in uh, books in print. That's pretty darn good, Brian. Well done. Thanks. We appreciate your coming by. Now, we've got some of those secrets and some more quick tricks on our website, it's all at the screensavers.com. Those secrets won't stay secret for long if we can help it. Thanks, Brian. We appreciate it. Now, folks, don't start flipping. Still to come on this very show, the Screensavers' own Roger Chang is here to get you ready for the ZDTV Cam Film Fest with a few tricks for shooting digital video. Also, more answers to your toughest computing problems. 
Plus, they can't all be winners. An MP3 player flop on today's Fresh Gear. All that and more as the screensavers roll on. Hollywood. Yeah, we're going digital. We're entering our own movies into ZDTV's second annual Cam Film Festival. You can win some really cool prizes, but hurry, March 31st is the deadline. ZDTV's second annual Cam Film Festival. Enter now. Need help? Go to ZDTV.com slash campfest. Central. Want DVDs, snacks, and video games delivered in just one hour? Then say goodbye to the Ice Cream Man and hello to the Cosmo Man. He's the number one hit with kids and credit card transactions. All thanks to the immature pranksters at Iconocast, who in a market test, ordered just one bag of M&Ms every day for three weeks. Cosmo drivers, which include the CEO at peak times, complain that their adult customers don't tip nearly as well as the teens. Hey, don't blame the parents. It's the kids' fault. They don't know the value of money. And watch out for Pink Dot. They're planning on trumping Cosmo's position with half-hour deliveries in L.A. Look for their profits to be offset by speeding tickets. Ha, ha, ha. Reporting for CDTV, this is Spencer F. Cat. We're back on the network talking with John Mallory from Oxford, Mississippi. What's up, son? Doing lovely, Tilda. Could you explain your website a little bit to me? Information, technology stocks. You have a, a whole section dedicated to how evil Leo Laporte is. He's an evil man. John, you're in deep trouble, John. <laughs> hey, Leo, how are you, man? Tilda, Tilda. <laughs> yeah. Man, it's strange. He's perverted. He's twisted. Yeah, I like him. Want to talk? Email me at Tilda at ZDTV.com. Where can you get your financial questions answered daily? Live on The Money Machine. Carmine Gallo and Pam Kruger bring you information and advice on how to make, manage, and save money using your computer. From investing online to managing your personal finances to finding bargains on the web, it's a guide to taking control of your money. You can't afford to miss it. The Money Machine, live, weekdays at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific on ZDTV. What's your favorite site? Hello, my name is Ken Montgomery from Austin, Texas, and my favorite site is Square Gamer, which is a site that gives me updated news, extensive media with movie clips, music, game tips, walkthroughs, and more about Squaresoft games. The forum is a great place to talk about the latest games and meet great people. www.squaregamer.com Tell us about your favorite site. Just go to ZDTV.com slash my favorite site. to the screensavers. Leo Laporte here. And Martin Sargent here, filling in for Kate Patello, who's a little under the weather. Thanks for joining us. She'll be back tomorrow, I'm Good. sure, though. Uh, let's uh, join... Uh, do we, we want to talk about the Top Talk or just go right to the next call? Let's go to Trevor. Let's go to Trevor. Why not? Hey, On the ZDTV 3Com Net Cam Network from Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Hello, Trev. Hey, Martin. Hey, Leo. Hey, up, man? How, how you doing? doing? I'm okay. What's Pretty up? Good. Well, my friend, or I guess he's my friend, decided to send me a Trojan and put it on my computer. <laughs> Your former friend. I guess so. Which Trojan did he send you? I have no clue. Okay. Uh -huh. But he how do you know me. he sent you one? He told you? Yeah, he did. So he may be messing with you in that regard, too. Maybe he didn't even send you one. You're looking to search for it. Can't that find could it. be. Let's, let's tell people what a Trojan is. You, you study, like, Greek, or Greek classics in school with the Trojan horse. You know, the Trojan horse that got snuck in there, and when everyone was in bed, they all jumped out of the Trojan horse and went and attacked the people and massacred them, right? Destroyed Troy entirely. Well, Raised the city. That's sort of what's going on here, and that someone like your friend sends one of these things to you, and you don't really know that you got it on your computer, and then it's going to strike. It's going to sneak up on you, come out, and do some damage. Or what can happen in the case of something like uh, NetBIOS or um, NetBus. NetBus or what's the other one? Back Sub Orifice. Seven, back Orifice. What happens is your friend could remotely control your computer 
if that thing is on there. That would be one of the symptoms, Trevor. You'd notice all of a sudden you'd see strange messages on your screen, or he'd go, ha, ha, ha. With Netbus, you can play sounds rant, remotely. You can make messages come out. You can even make the CD drawer go in and out, like, this, like basically like your machine is possessed. You getting those kinds of symptoms, Trevor? Yes, I have been. Uh, uh, there you go. Friend, nice guy. Yeah. Now, it's, if a friend does it, it's a practical joke. Yeah, but these things are designed by sort of these shifty hacker groups. Some of cult of the dead cow. Yeah, they, what claim, do they, have to? they claim it's a it's a kind of a service. That they're yeah, providing. yeah, they're trying to point out security flaws in Windows. But I don't know what we that. could tell you is that if you've got a Trojan like Netbus or Back Orifice or Sub Seven. One of the side effects of those is the person can download, look at and download all the files on your hard drive or destroy all the files on your hard drive. So they do have a lot of access. The solution is pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's really, any good antivirus program is going to be able to solve this for you. We recommend Norton Antivirus. Just go and get that one. And uh, it should be able to disinfect it and totally purge it from your system. And I'm sure that anyone that you have is going to be in their library of viruses. Yeah, there, if you keep an antivirus program up to date, they're pretty yeah. good. Those are... You know, currently, Trojan horses are one of the worst uh, offenders in the virus world, so they're going to keep these up. You can see right here that some of the new ones are the Buddy List Trojan horse, PW Steel Trojan, which is a password stealer. Uh, there, you know, so there's, there's a lot of Trojans out there. It's not that hard to write them, and uh, you get them uh, either by a buddy who gives you a floppy or sneaks into your system, or by bad guys who mail them to you. And a lot of times, that's how a Trojan horse comes to you. It says... You know, a, one of the early ones was AOL, called AOL for free, and the message uh -huh. would say, would you like to get AOL for free? Just run this program, and AOL will stop charging you. Well, it didn't stop charging you. What the program did was watch when you logged on to AOL and emailed your password to the hacker, <laughs> who then had access to your account. So that's definitely something you want to get rid of. If you have an antivirus, Trevor, update it, run it. It should detect and destroy, okay? Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'm glad you asked. Now, would you do us a favor? Sure. Take us to break, my friend? All right. Okay. Thanks, Martin and Leo. If you want to win the Cam Film Festival, listen up. Roger Chang is here with a few tricks for shooting video when the screensavers continues. Very nicely done. Thank yes, you, thank Kevin. You. See you later, guy. You too. <laughs> yeah. Bill Gates' keynote at the Windows 2000 conference. Stream it live Thursday at 12.30 Eastern, 9.30 Pacific at ZDTV.com. Sponsored by Compaq. We're talking to people in Boston about ZDTV. How do you feel when you hold that cube? Like a square. When I see red, it gets me really angry. Down with tyranny! Up with ZDTV! Pong. That was my first computer. Really? Yeah! Do you ever use a computer for any sort of mutinous activity? No, I don't. I'm not saying. One if by land and two if by ZDTV. <laughs> it's Blockhead, your personal tour guide to the world of art through technology. Today's adventure, we visit the Sega Dreamcast audio specialists at Visual Concepts. Hi, I'm Brian Luzzetti. Uh, I'm the audio director here at Visual Concepts. One of the biggest jobs I had to do was come up with the design for our NBA and NFL games. We wanted it to sound exactly like when you're watching a game on television. It's going inside! It's going inside! I do all the sound effects for the games and the movies and all of our products. Larry recorded thousands and thousands of sound effects. We have somewhere around 18,000 lines of speech. Brian, on the other hand, does all the music for the game. So when you're playing one play of our football game, you're going to hear all the sound effects, all the players, the grunts, the pat hits, the ball finds the air, people catching it, you're hearing the crowd yelling, you're hearing individual people in the crowd saying stuff. So in one 15-second play, you're going over about 10, 11 months of work for Larry. For more information, visit Blockhead at ZDTV.com slash Blockhead. Through the ages, Linux has seen many variations. If only there were one Linux product, which offered ease of use with high-end sophistication. Now there is Linux Mandrake 7.0 from Macmillan, USA. The place for Linux. The Screensavers.com is the best place for more information about our fine little program here. If you want to know more about this week's Hard Drive Super Geek Challenge, take it and learn all about the latest in hard drives. It's at the Screensavers.com. Congratulations, by the way, to Robert from Mansfield, New Jersey. He's the winner of yesterday's 
Super Geek Quiz. He's got, uh, he got himself a t-shirt or a hat. I'm sorry, a cap. And if you want to win, you just fill out that form after you take the Super Geek Challenge and you'll have a chance to win, too. We give away one every single day. The second annual ZDTV Cam Film Fest is approaching. The deadline for entries is just a, about a month away. For the next uh, couple of months, every Wednesday, we are going to feature some uh, segments to show you how to create your own digital film entry so you can enter and win the Cam Film Festival. This week, we've invited screensavers, associate producer, and official camera type guy, Roger Chang, to share his video secrets. Roger, you have like a certificate, a piece of paper that says, you know. Yes. It's actually a computer printout from a dot matrix printer. <laughs> no kidding. Really? Yes. And you actually paid for this? Actually, ZD TV paid They for sent it. you there. And, and what, what exactly is the certificate in? <laughs> it's a digital field production. Okay. So you know about all this stuff. I that paid. We've sent you out on the screensavers to shoot yeah. stuff, and, uh, and it usually comes back. Uh, yes, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so show us now what we're, what we're going to do. What things should people be keep, keeping in mind uh, when they're going to uh, do, go out there and, and tape their cam film? The festival? primary thing that you want to do when you get a brand new camera is read the manual from front to cover. No, I don't read manual. Twice. Really? No, read it. Really? There's, you, you'll cut a lot of grief out of your time okay. if you read. There are quirks, there are idiosyncrasies, there are things quirks. that are non-intuitive. Um, Every company has a different way of implementing features that you would normally associate with the camera. They're not always in the same place. Okay. And you'll be scratching your head for, like I did, for 30 minutes trying to figure out where the on button is on certain cameras. Yeah, yeah you know, a lot of times these are. They're very difficult to, to use. Now, this camera is a nice one. This is the Canon Allure. The Canon Allure. You're not crazy about it, but it's good enough, right? Yes, uh, I'm not crazy about it from a field shoot perspective. Because it's not wide angle enough? Um, there's some features lacking that I would preferably have on a field camera. Well, chief among those is uh, more control over aperture settings, uh, shutter speeds, and a longer focal length. And yet, you know, a lot of cameras like this have too many features, right? Yes, that's one of the things that you want to stay away from is special effects features that come with your camera. They actually make life harder for you if you're trying to do post-production. Okay. So once you have your video, because essentially what you're doing is you're taking raw content and pre-editing before right. you get... So shoot raw film, just yes. shoot it straight, you'll do it, fix it back you'll, in the, in you'll the edit. Get, you film more than what you actually need. That'll right. give you pieces to work with. It'll give you more to work with. Now, I've seen you out in the field, and you're always holding up these white pieces of paper. What are you doing there? I'm white balancing the camera. White balancing basically... The pieces of paper say, we'll shoot for food. I don't mean that you... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No. You're, you're white balancing. That's the one I snagged off your desk. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> oh, oh! Ow! So, white balancing is what? White balancing is you're basically adjusting the chrominance of the camera, how it sees color. And since color is a ratio, you only have to set it to one color. And since white is considered right. all the color in the spectrum, you set it to that. But indoors tends to be orangey, outdoors tends to be yeah, blue. So, so you've you, got to do the white balance so that it looks you, the same. Every time, your light change, every time you set it for one light and the light changes drastically, or even minutely enough that it looks different, you want right. to re-white balance again. Okay. Uh, the flip side is that if you want a little artsy feel to it, you can actually... You can actually white balance to a hotter or colder color, like okay. say blue. Right. You can actually get a kind of a bluish tint to your video. You would you would do that in the camera rather than do that when you get back to the edit. Suite. Um, yeah, it depends. Um, like I said, sometimes you 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 really don't want to do any of this before until you actually get to post production where you get special effects. Okay. Now we want to avoid nausea in our nausea. viewers. One of the key things that you'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, you notice if you zoom in on now he's, things, you're doing a handheld shoot. You'll notice that all the little uh, movements I'm making show up very it's readily. Bouncing around, yeah. So if you're doing a handheld, it's best to actually zoom out of what you're shooting. Right. And basically, you're just attenuating all the little Yes, yes, movements not nearly as bad. Now, on the other hand, unless you're doing this in a special effect, you might want to get a tripod and, and get a really steady uh, shot, yeah? Yes. Um, basically, yeah, if you want to do a perfectly still shot, the only thing with this tripod is you're lacking in only two dimensions of movement, tilt and pan. Right. So if you want to actually move physically out, you're going to have to stop and move it. And sometimes you actually do want to do it handheld to give it a little more dynamic feel. Right. Other than just always a static it's a, it's shot. A, but it's a style. Yes, you should do it intentionally, not by accident. Yeah, you want to plan everything out before you even shoot. Right. So What's you this? Now, these are these little filters here, These right? are accessories that you want to consider when you get your uh, brand new camera. Okay. And the oops, chief among these is the UV filter. Now, this belongs to a different camera. This belongs to a different camera. This actually belongs you actually to the... have the UV camera on. This belongs filter. to the larger cousin of the uh, this the Allura. Now, thing. why do I want a UV filter? This is just clear, isn't it's, it? It's clear and it's transparent offers absolutely very, if any, uh, optical filtering, filtering capabilities. But what it does offer is protection for your lens. So it, These it, are like $40. You scratch that, toss right. it, get a new one. Right. You scratch your lens on your camera, which right. costs 1500 and up. 
then you know you're out serious cash trying okay. to get it repaired. So actually, that's true. Also, still cameras. I always yes. use one of these. Now, what? But what would you use these uh, other filters? One on? is a new. This is a polarizing, and the other one is a neutral density. You use okay. those for different lighting conditions, especially outdoors when it's a really bright day. Okay, so it darkens it down a little. Uh, it, yes, it attenuates reduces the bright light. So it re exactly reduces the glare. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the, this. This is a car adapter for your battery? Car adapter. We're not, when you're out shooting in the boonies, you're not always close enough to an electrical outlet to recharge your battery. This is a handy thing to have. So you usually want a car battery, so, yeah. uh, car right. charger. And then your camera will work and your car won't, but at least you'll get the shot. Yes, That's which actually important. leads me to the second thing. Is What's that? Extra, extra batteries. Always have extra batteries. You know, it's, as much as battery technology and camera technology has improved, they still need power like... In fact, ours just ran out, I think. Yes, <laughs> and it was actually on a full charge for, really? for the, for sure, oh, for the show started. Really? So so, you always carry extra batteries with you. Why, why did you bring these along? Sound. People don't really take sound into consideration, but sound is one of the most important things you do when you take, when you I don't know why I'm doing this. It's not connected to anything. Um, the camera that, the mic that comes on the camera is usually an omnidirectional mic, which means... These aren't very good. Um, they're good, but they pick up everything around you, including right. behind, Wind, side, traffic, people walking right. behind you. So a directional microphone, one that you directional can Directional or one that you can control. It basically allows you more control over what you're doing. Right. Right. So instead of having everything, well, you know, don't everyone move behind me. I don't want you to hear right. walk by. Right. You basically have more control. It adds more flexibility to a shoot as well. Right. Okay. The headphones are very important because you can't really monitor the sound unless you're listening to it. Right. So you they, don't want to have to stop, yeah. play it back. Sounds then that you like, oh, they wouldn't be able to hear it. You can actually right. hear because these mics are extremely sensitive. Right. So if you you can hear, you can actually adjust it or correct the. Plus, changes. it looks really cool if you wear these around. It looks here. professional. Yeah, it's very professional. Whoa, <laughs> nice catch. Thank you, Thank you Roger. <laughs> if you, wow. If you would like to know more about digital video camera tips and tricks, just visit thescreensavers.com for Roger's complete article on the subject. He's got a certificate. Just because it's available doesn't mean it's worth buying. Here's Sumida. Do this with me now. Come on. Okay. Here's Sumidas with a not-so-kind look at a new portable MP3 music player. And remember, you're going to do the thing when the... Okay. Well, on today's Fresh Gear. <laughs> It's getting to be a Me Too world out there in MP3 land, and Audiobox is jumping on the bandwagon with their new MP3 player, the MPDJ1000. Although the MP1000 is tiny, it offers an easy-to-read LCD and delivers solid MP3 playback through the earbud headphones. While the onboard 32 megabytes of memory is standard, you can add additional memory to the device via the multimedia card slot increasing the storage to 64 megs, which is about one hour of near CD quality music. After seeing the portable jukebox from Remote Solutions and the Creative Nomad jukebox, an hour of music now seems rather puny, especially since both of these players offer over 80 hours of storage. However, those units will cost you hundreds more. The MP1000 AudioVox includes MPDJ software, but instead of one application that handles all our MP3 needs, it splits the functions across three different software applications. The MPDJ browser loads files onto the MP player. The MPDJ encoder creates MP3 files from your CDs or other audio files. And the MPDJ player is for playback on your PC. Jumping between all three applications was a little tiring. The MPDJ is an okay portable player, but with all the other options out there, this one gets lost in the crowd. Overall, we give the MPDJ1000 by Audiobox two out of five stars. It's $179 and is available now. You can catch a new Fresh Gear every weekend afternoon at 12.30 Central right here on ZDTV. Hold on there, Bippy. We're not done yet. In just one minute, more answers to your toughest computing problems when the screensaver continues. All right. All right. You know what they call me in the chat room? They call me the wrecking ball. You know why? Because I can come into the liveliest conversation, say something that totally throws a monkey into the wrench. They say, well, you know, I hear Kashmir um, was dating uh, that girl from blah, 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 blah. And I come in and I say, I'm having trouble breathing. I'm the wrecking ball, baby, and you can't stop me. Your Elvis impersonation falls upon deaf ears in the chat room. This is the ZDTV.com Chat Palace, the only place to chat with ZDTV fans and hosts. Hey, Gino. How you doing, Kate? Hey, Vinnie Boom Fats and I have a bet going. 
What does BIO stand for? BIO stands for Basic Input Output System. Pay up, Benny. No. <laughs> Imagine that. She's the host of a TV show. She's talking to me. The Chat Palace is open now at ZDTV.com. Click on Interact. Hey, Mr. Money Machine, can Benny borrow $20? Welcome back to the Screensavers. Martin's here, Bippy's here, whoever that is, and Mark is on the phone from Hartford, Connecticut. Hello, Mark. Hey, hi. How you doing? Great. Mm -hmm. Home of Mark Twain. You're not Mark yeah. Twain, are you? No, but I'm a couple miles away. Yeah, that's a great one. Mark of many homes. Well, that Mark Twain house is there, though. It's really well, cool. There's yeah, a, there's another one in Elmira, New York. Oh, really? Out here, there's one. Yeah, he would defend Why? Elmira. Yeah. So, what can we do for you, Mark? Uh, I have a. Uh, New hard drive I got for Christmas with yeah. uh, 27 gig. I love yeah. it. Wow! <laughs> That's gigantic! Which one is it? That IBM Death Star 27 gigger? No, it's the uh, Max Star, Diamond Max. Oh, very right. nice. nice. I have and, Max Stars at home. I'm very happy with them. Yeah, $219 with a $30 rebate. Good deal. <laughs> so, um, so what's the question? Um, the well, dragon. I have it partitioned in things, um, and uh, I have to use something called EZ BIOS. Ah, uh, you have an older machine? Yeah, well, it's not too old. It's only a couple years old, Pentium 2, 333. Yeah, some of the, okay, Pentium 2, well, I, should, I should see it, but some of the older machines won't see anything larger than 8 gigabytes. So if you make the partitions less than 8, you won't need to use Easy BIOS. What it is, is anything more than 1,024 cylinders. Older, your machine, I shouldn't have the problem, but it might. Yeah, they've had that 8.4 gig thing fixed for a while. Well, it might no. be operating, so, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say your machine shouldn't, but if it does, if you make anything less, you have a partition bigger than 8? I don't think so, but I, I think it's the cylinder thing I'm bumping into. Well, yeah, that's right. The, the thing is, if you keep the partitions low, you shouldn't have... Well, maybe you do. All right, so I'll take your word for it. You need to use Easy BIOS. <laughs> yeah, um, well, what I'm wondering is, there any, there's no way to get around that. And the other thing is that it, um, some of the uh, antivirus things think my boot record is right. mm -hmm. funky. Because you have a non-standard master boot record. What Easy BIOS is, it's just a program that tricks the operating system into being able to read those extra large hard drives. But it does it by putting something on the master boot record. Obviously, it has to because it has to load in before anything else does, or you won't be able to see the hard drive, right? Yeah. So the antiviruses look at the master boot record and say, this is non-standard. You have a virus. Just turn off their master boot checking. Master boot viruses are very uncommon nowadays. They used to be the most common form because they require, they went, they transported by floppy. They require you to catch it. You have to boot from a floppy with a virus. Not likely anymore, right? Oh. Yeah, like Michelangelo and Stone, all of those were boot record uh, viruses. You got them from booting from a floppy with the virus on it. If, as long as you don't use floppies, you're not going to get a master boot record virus, so you could turn off that MBR check. Now, can you get rid of Easy BIOS? Pro probably, if you have a P2 computer, I would look and see if there's a BIOS update for your computer that will support large hard drives. The other thing you want to do is, when you boot up, make sure that, you know, the set in the BIOS setup where it tells you what kind of hard drives you got? Mm -hmm. you, it probably it should say auto. But if, it, if it's not detecting this large hard drive, you might try LB, large LBA, large block addressing, okay, as the, as the hard drive type. And that might actually solve it. What happened is the BIOS has had to be rewritten, reconfigured. Nobody ever thought hard drives would have more than 1,024 cylinders. They just said, it's not <laughs> going to happen. So all these BIOSes are designed to kind of top out at that number. So uh, you can either trick them with this easy BIOS software. There's other, every company has its own software to do this. Or you can update your BIOS to use large block addressing, which is another way of doing it that does it within BIOS. And then everything's back to normal. So take a look there, okay? Okay, great. I'll, I'll the other thing, do that. Often just, often just having smaller partitions will fix it. But if you say you don't have anything larger than 8 gigs, then I don't it's think it's, that's problem, it. No. Yeah. 8 gigs is where the 1024 usually hits. Okay. okay. Can you take a look at my home page? Sure. Real it's, quick, because we're almost out of time here. It's at over.2 slash FZPR, free zip program reviews. Oh, you review zip programs? Freeware. Freeware. Over.2 to slash, slash free FZPR. 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 That's cool. Who do you, you just do it for your website? Yeah, I did it all with freeware. Oh, what's, that's neat. What's the best freeware ever? Yeah, great question. Oh, I, I don't know. I, well, the best freeware zip program? Yeah, which one do you like the best? Depends on what you want to do. Right now, I kind of like NZIP, ENZIP. <laughs> I've never, you know, I didn't even know there were freeware zip programs. I will take a look at it. We all use WinZip, which is shareware. I That's thought everyone great. used Over dot two F Z P R. I'll put it in the show notes. We're going to have some closing thoughts and parting shots when the screensavers continues. Thanks for the call. Bye bye. Well
a daily dose of the best from the net. Coming up on the show, NBA.com goes to the All-Star Game. Robot dogs go back on sale. The guru on cyber cafes and Internet Tonight's very first spit take. Internet Tonight, coming up next on ZDTV. Be a part of the fastest growing network on TV. The ZDTV 3Com Netcam Network. The online community that puts you on ZDTV. You're watching Silicon City. Asking computer questions. I've got a little problem with my Clio. Hey! Showing your digital shorts and chatting with our hosts. Aloha, gentlemen. Aloha, children. Go to ZDTV.com and send us your email today. Amaze yourself. ZDTV. Amaze yourself. Talking with Randy, CEO of WeQuit.com. How you doing, Tut? Doing fine. You have started a website called We Quit. That's right. Right. Now, what are we quitting? We are quitting smoking, uh, lose weight, uh, learn self-control, um, uh, learn to quit drinking. We are quitting uh, basically anything you want to quit. Wow. Now, how exactly are we going to learn how to quit all this stuff? <laughs> Through the uh, hypnotism. Is this a free program here? This is a free program, I work on uh, strictly donations. You might call it uh, kind of the shareware of hypnotism, if you will, <laughs> or freeware. And that way, it helps people that uh, can't afford programs like this. Maybe you can just hypnotize people and have them come work for you for free. Well, that, that, that's true. That's true. Uh, hey, it worked. I'm on television, aren't I? Hey, fringe benefits. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> How many times have you been on ZDTV? I think something fishy's going on here. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Want to talk? Email me at tilda at zdtv.com. What do you think? At ZDTV, we're waiting to hear from you. Pick your favorite ZDTV show and talk back at zdtv.com. Click on Interact. Welcome back to the Screen Savers. The preliminary results of today's web poll. 54% of you say you're drowning in email, but it's pretty darn close. Poll's not over, though. 24 hours to vote at thescreensavers.com. This is the time of the show. We'd like to check in with some of the emails. You got anything uh, there? Here's an Martin? interesting one. Yes. Howdy, ladies and gents. This is Jesse from Bryan, Texas. He heard, he heard that the human eye can only distinguish between 8 and 10 million colors, and that some of these fancy new scanners like the Epson Perfection can scan 68 billion colors. So what's the point? I don't know. I don't know about the 68 billion number, but it is true that these good scanners can actually recognize more colors in the human eye. It's a pretty and the amazing. reason is there are about 32 bit. I don't know what the n that number comes out to, how many actual colors, but... Uh, two to the 32th, two whatever to the 32, that is. Yeah, and the reason they do that, actually, 32 bit as opposed to 24 bit, which is really all the human eye can understand, is because uh, 8 times 4 is easier than 8 times 3. That's right? right. It's easier to represent 4 bytes than it is to represent 3 bytes. For a computer. You're seeing this more and more on video cards. They used to be 24 bit, which everybody said was true color, because it had uh -huh. two million, could represent two million colors, the, the, the max the human eye could see. 30, I think 32-bit is four billion. It's more than you can resolve, but it's just easier from software to write four, four, four bytes than three bytes. Still seems fishy, I don't know. It seems fishy. Eric Anderson from Cole Township, Pennsylvania. He and his brother are getting a, he's got a Mac, his brother's getting a compact. He wanted to network them together. Can they share internet connections? Yeah, very easily. All you have to do is put proxy server software on the PC, put them all on the LAN, and then tell the Mac to use as its gateway router the IP address of the PC. Give the Mac a dummy address beginning with 10.0.0 and uh, you should be all set. If you go to AnalogX's proxy uh, uh, site, AnalogX.com, they'll tell you about it. That's it for this edition of Screen Savers. I'm Leo Laporte. I'm Martin Sargent. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. See you next time. Bye-bye. Kate will be back tomorrow. Good
ZDTV News at the top of the hour is sponsored by MSN. Call 877-YOUR-MSN or visit msn.com to get the everyday web. This is the MSN project, day one. The four of us are moving into a totally empty house. Everything we need, we'll get from the internet with MSN. Day is ready! We'll connect with MSN, and then we'll use it for everything we do online. You know, it's empty, but I think that we're going to fill it with love. Oh, I'm going to order me a bed. Call 1-877-YOUR-MSN to get the everyday web. Now, the latest from the ZD Network Newsroom. Hello, I'm Victoria Ricagno for ZDNN. Chip giant Intel says it will drop Sun Microsystems as a partner on its upcoming IA64 platform. An Intel spokesman says his company will honor its contract with Sun to use the company's Solaris operating system on the upcoming Intel Itanium processor. But after that, Intel will be looking at other platforms, including Linux and Project Monterey from IBM. And you can keep up with the very latest on high-tech crime, security, and privacy issues by watching a new weekly show here on ZDTV. ZDTV legal analysts Alex Wellen and Luke Ryder host Cybercrime. The half-hour magazine-style show airs every Friday at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 Pacific. For in-depth articles on any stories, anytime, go to cybercrime.com. Tonight on Internet Tonight, the new wired version of the NBA All-Star Game. And a site that can perhaps make your vacation easier, plus the story of St. Ohm, free thinker and fancy house decorator. Hide the drapes, Myrtle. It's time for Internet Tonight. Welcome to yet another solitary edition of Internet Tonight. I'm Scott Harriet, topping Internet news tonight. Are you lonesome tonight? Well, according to a new Stanford 